Curiously enough, when I came to Tiffany in 1979, one of the first questions I was always asked, um, did Louis Cumber Tiffany have anything to do with Tiffany and Company? Well, I made it my business to prove to the world that yes, he did. Not only was he the son of the founder, he eventually inherited the company, he owned the company, <laughs> he was the design director of the company, and he brought incredible um, distinction to not only Tiffany and Company, but to the United States as probably the greatest decorative artist of the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, he did not start from modest beginnings, as you can well imagine. If your father founded and owned Tiffany and Company, you had certain advantages in your art education that other people didn't have. And before we start looking at that, I just want to <coughs> explain to you very quickly um, where that art education had begun. He had studied with the um, American landscape painter George Innes here in America, 
And then three years after the Civil War, when it became possible for Americans to travel again, for Americans to study, um, he was sent by his father to study with an Orientalist painter in Paris, um, Léon Boilly. Now, to understand this, and I, I'm going to talk about this for a little bit because I want you to look carefully and think about what you're looking at in relation to what he learned in Paris. Um, Paris in, 19, in 1868 <laughs> was obviously an incredibly glamorous and incredibly money city. Um, Japan had only been opened up a very short time before. Every Paris collector had to have things from Japan, Japanese lacquers, Japanese woodblock prints, Japanese brocades, Japanese absolutely everything. It was Japanism mania by the time that Louis Comfort Tiffany got to Paris. Now, there were many currents going on in Paris in um, 1868. I'm sure you were all there. You remember the Empress Eugenie opened the Suez Canal in 1868, and this brought on another wave of interest in other cultures. It brought on Egyptomania, since this was the great French project, the Suez Canal, and the Empress herself had gone and opened it. Um, by the way, she did not go around in a lovely, um, expensive automobile. She was a very fine horsewoman, and she rode a camel to open the Suez Canal. <laughs> Um, this brought with it a new wave of the Nile style in Egyptomania. So along with his Orientalist painter teacher, who was very interested in the Islamic arts of North Africa and the Middle East, you had this fanatic interest in Japan, which had influenced all the Impressionist painters. You think of Manet with the Japanese bands and prints in the backs of his paintings, and this Orientalism. So as you look at this, you're going to see all these currents. And some people say, but oh, it's so diverse. He did not have a great focus. Yes, he certainly did have a focus because he assimilated all of these influences into the most co coherent body of decorative arts that has probably ever been produced. So let's have a little look at what that actually looked like. Um, one reason that Kalamazoo is a great place for the repository of his mosaic samples is he first became world famous at the Chicago World's Exposition of 1893, <clears throat> not very far away from here. Well, when I was little, it took seven hours to drive. Now it takes me an hour and 55 minutes, but I don't obey the speed limits. Um, <laughs> this, this was the, a chapel that he showed in Chicago in 1893. Um, you're not going to see Tiffany lamps and vases. You're going to see Tiffany mosaics and also Tiffany windows. And he won gold medals for this chapel. It's now on display at the, the Tiffany Garden Museum in Winter Park, Florida, if you're ever in Florida and want to see it. But this was the beginning of this, and it was based on mosaics. You see what? The, the, the mosaic collections that I gave to you um, related directly to what happened in Chicago a few miles away from here in 1893. Now, <laughs> as I said, Mr. Tiffany did not come from ordinary origins. This There is a picture of Mr. Tiffany, what he looked like at the height. People often say, what did this man look like? Was he kind of a bohemian artist? No, he was not. He was, as you can see, a great golden age gentleman. And you see the central hall of his house on Long Island. He obviously had a huge mansion in New York, and this was Laurel Hall. And as you look at it, you see many of these uh, you know, oriental influences that led that, that, that he, he, he pursued through his entire life. I'm sorry that there are no more detailed pictures of this, but I think it gives you a general idea of the lifestyle of the person whose work you're going to be looking at. Now, one of the great symbols of the period was a peacock feather. And he didn't go into jewelry until 1904, but I just put this at the beginning <coughs> because it shows how he could stylize a very familiar image and turn it into something 
um, very beautiful and very wearable, which a peacock feather is not. And also to show you, as you will look at his windows and his love, you're familiar with his vases with their less than iridescent surfaces, his love of stones like opals, which bore a very close resemblance to the glass and the surfaces of the things he was doing. Now, <coughs> his first jewels were shown two years after he inherited Tiffany and became the design director at the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904. And another very interesting part of Mr. Tiffany, although he was completely exposed to um, Oriental, Orientalism and the arts of Japan and many, many of these other influences, he was more influenced by anything else than American nature. So the first time he showed jewelry of his own design, it employed things that you will find in all of your gardens. There is his bittersweet necklace from 1904 and a wild berry brooch from 1904. And <coughs> of course, he saw the beauty in such simple things as dandelions. This is not a completed jewel. This, he had not completed it by 1904. They were parts of hair ornaments, and he simply tied a string around them and showed them. But they are extraordinarily beautiful, but showing what he saw in the beauty of nature and how that could be interpreted into high art and jewelry. This is one of the most beautiful pieces of, from, the, from the 1904 St. Louis Exposition, and it's of that thing that grows by every roadside around Kalamazoo. Queen Anne's lace, but beautifully done in enamels and small opals, a magnificent jewel that received great, great acclaim in 1904. And, and back to this theme of um, America's love of nature, not, you know, our country really didn't base its art and design on appropriating images from European cultures that were 2,000 years old. Um, fortunately, our artists and designers rather turned their back on that and look to American nature for inspiration. And I think this is a perfectly beautiful example of what you could do looking at the most simple American weed and turning it into a magnificent piece of jewelry, which by the way, um, the Metropolitan Museum recently paid $200,000 for that. <laughs> another use of, the, another use of um, the dandelion, but combined with a symbol that he inherited from the Japanese influences. The first major designer at Tiffany was a man named Edward C. Moore, who had bought many things from Secret Bing's Oriental Bazaar in Paris, later from the Maison d'Ar Nouveau. And as you know, in Japanese culture, the dragonfly is a harbinger of good luck. So it's something that Louis Comfort Tiffany inherited from Edward C. Moore, and you will see throughout his work, and when you go out and look at the exhibit here, you will see several examples of dragonfly lamps. It became almost a signature of Louis Comfort Tiffany.